Hello, and welcome to Victorian Periodical Parade. Here today, we shall be reading from the April 18th installment of the London Journal, published in 1863. For now, I will be reading Chapter 13, Troubled Dreams. Robert Audley left Southampton by the mail and let himself into his chambers just as the dawn was creeping cold and grey into the solitary rooms, and the canaries were beginning to rustle their feathers feebly in the early morning. There were several letters in the box behind the door, but there was none from George Talboys. The young barrister was worn out by a long day spent in hurrying from place to place. The usual lazy monotony of his life had been broken as it had never been broken before in eight and twenty tranquil, easy-going years. His mind was beginning to grow confused upon the point of time. It seemed to him months since he had lost sight of George Talboys. It was so difficult to believe that it was less than 48 hours ago that the young man had left him sleeping under the willows by the trout stream. His eyes were painfully weary for want of sleep. He searched about the rooms for some time, looking in all sorts of impossible places for a letter from George Talboys, and then threw himself dressed upon his friend's bed in the room with the canaries and geraniums. "'I shall wait for tomorrow morning's post,' he said, "'and if that brings no letter from George, "'I shall start for Liverpool without a moment's delay.' He was thoroughly exhausted and fell into a heavy sleep, a sleep which was profound without being altogether refreshing, for he was tormented all the time by disagreeable dreams, Dreams which were painful, not from any horror in themselves, but from a vague and wearying sense of their confusion and absurdity. At one time he was pursuing strange people and entering strange houses in the endeavor to unravel the mystery of the telegraphic dispatch. At another time he was in the churchyard at Ventnor, gasping at the headstone George had ordered for the grave of his dead wife. Once in the long, rambling mystery of those dreams, he went to the grave and found the headstone gone, and on remonstrating with the stonemason, was told that the man had a reason for removing the inscription, a reason that Robert would someday learn. He started from his dreams to find there was someone knocking at the door of his chambers. It was a dreary, wet morning, the rain beating against the windows and the canaries twittering dismally to each other, complaining, perhaps, of the bad weather. Robert could not tell how long the person had been knocking. He had heard the sound with his dreams, and when he woke, he was only half conscious of other things. Is that stupid Miss Maloney, I dare say, he muttered. She may knock again for all I care. Why can't she use her duplicate key instead of dragging a man out of bed when he's half dead with fatigue? The person, whoever it was, did knock again and desisted, apparently tired out. But a minute afterwards, a key turned in the door. She had her key with her all the time then, said Robert. I am very glad I didn't get up. The door between the sitting room and the bedroom was half open, and he could see the laundress bustling about, dusting the furniture and rearranging things that had never been disarranged. "'Is that you, Miss Maloney?' he said. "'Yes, sir. Then why, in goodness' name, did you make that row at the door when you had a key with you all the time?' "'A row at the door, sir? Yes, that infernal knocking.' Sure, I never knocked, Mr. Audley, but walked straight in with the key. Then who did knock? There's been someone kicking up a row at the door for a quarter of an hour, I should think. You must have met him going downstairs. But I'm rather late this morning, sir, for I've been in Mr. Martin's rooms first, and I've come straight from the floor above. Then you didn't see anyone at the door or on the stairs? Not a mortal soul. Was ever anything so provoking, said Robert. 
to think that I should have let this person go away without ascertaining who he was or what he wanted? How do I know that it was not someone with a message or letter from George Talboys? Sure, if it was, sir, he'll come again, said Miss Maloney soothingly. Yes, of course. If it was anything of consequence, he'll come again, muttered Robert. The fact was that from the moment of finding the telegraphic message at Southampton, all hope of hearing of George had faded out of his mind. He felt that there was some mystery involved in the disappearance of his friend, some treachery towards himself or towards George. What if the young man's greedy old father-in-law had tried to separate them on account of the monetary trust lodged in Robert Audley's hands? Or what if, since even in these civilized days all kinds of unsuspected horrors are constantly committed, what if the old man had decoyed George down to Southampton and made away with him in order to get possession of the twenty thousand pound left in Robert's custody for little George's use? But neither of those superstitions explained the telegraphic message, and it was the telegraphic message which had filled Robert's mind with a vague sense of alarm. The postman brought no letter from George Talboys, and the person who had knocked at the door of the chambers did not return between seven and nine o'clock. So Robert Audley left Fig Tree Court once more in search of his friend. This time he told the cabman to drive to Euston Station, and in twenty minutes he was on the platform making inquiries about the trains. The Liverpool Express had started half an hour before he reached the station, and he had to wait an hour and a quarter for a slow train to take him to his destination. Robert Audley chaffed cruelly at the delay. Half a dozen vessels might sail for Australia while he roamed up and down the long platform tumbling over tracks and porters and swearing at his ill luck. He bought the Times newspaper and looked instinctively at the second column with a morbid intent in the advertisements of people missing, sons, brothers, and husbands who had left their homes never to return or to be heard of more. There was one advertisement of a young man who was found drowned somewhere in the Lambeth shores. What? If this should have been George's fate, no, the telegraphic message involved his father-in-law in the fact of his disappearance, and every speculation about him must start from that one point. It was eight o'clock in the evening when Robert got into Liverpool, too late for anything except to make inquiries as to what vessels had sailed within the last two days for the Antipoles. An emigrant ship had sailed at four o'clock that afternoon, the Victoria Regia, bound for Melbourne. The result of his inquiries amounted to this. If he wanted to find who had sailed in the Victoria Regalia, he must wait till the next morning and apply for information of that vessel. Robert Audley was at the office at nine o'clock the next morning and was the first person after the clerk who entered it. He met with every activity from the clerk to whom he applied. The young man referred to his books, and running his pen down the list of passengers who had sailed in the Victoria Regia, told Robert that there was no one among them of the name of Talboys. He pushed his inquiries further. Had any of the passengers entered their names within a short time of the vessel's sailing? One of the other clerks looked up from his desk as Robert asked the question. Yes he said. He remembered a young man's coming into the office at half past three o'clock in the afternoon and paying his passage money. His name was on the list, Thomas Brown. Robert Audley shrugged his shoulders. There could have been no possible reason for George taking a feigned name. He asked the clerk who had spoken if he could remember the appearance of this Mr. Thomas Brown. No, the office was crowded at the time, people were running in and out, and he had not taken any particular notice of the last passenger. Robert thanked them for the civility and wished them good morning. As he was leaving the office, one of the younger men called after him. Oh, by the by, sir, he said, I remember one thing about this Mr. Thomas Brown. His arm was in a sling. There was nothing more for Robert Audley to do but to return to town. 
He re-entered his chambers at six o'clock that evening, thoroughly worn out, more with his useless search. Miss Maloney brought him his dinner and a pint of wine from a tavern in the Strand. The evening was raw and chilly, and the laundress had lighted a good fire in the sitting room grate. After eating about half a mutton chop, Robert sat with his wine untasted upon the table before him, smoking cigars and staring into the blaze. George Talboy's never sailed for Australia, he said after long and painful reflection. If he is alive, he is still in England, and if he is dead, his body is hidden in some corner of England. He sat for hours smoking and thinking, troubled and gloomy thoughts, leaving a dark shadow upon his moody face, which neither the brilliant light of the gas nor the red blaze of the fire could dispel. Very late in the evening, he rose from his chair, pushed away the table, and wheeled his desk over to the fireplace, took out a sheet of foolscap, and dipped a pen in ink. But after doing this, he paused, leaned his forehead upon his hand, and once more relapsed into thought. I shall draw upon a record of all that has occurred between our going down to Essex and tonight, beginning at the very beginning. He drew up the record in short, detached sentences, which he numbered as he wrote. It ran thus. Journal of facts connected with the disappearance of George Talboys. Inclusive of facts which have no apparent relation to the circumstance. In spite of the troubled state of his mind, he was rather inclined to be proud of the official appearance of this heading. He sat for some time looking at it with affection and with the feather of his pen in his mouth. Upon my word, he said, I begin to think that I ought to have pursued my profession instead of dawdling my life away as I have done. He smoked half a cigar before he had got his thoughts in proper train and then began to write. One. I write to Alicia, proposing to take George down to the court. 2. Alicia writes objecting to the visit in part of Lady Audley. 3. We go to Essex in spite of this objection. I see my lady. My lady refuses to be introduced to George that particular evening on the score of fatigue. 4. Sir Michael invites George and me to dinner for the following evening. 5. My lady receives a telegraphic dispatch the next morning, which summons her to London. 6. Alicia shows me a letter from my lady, in which she requests to be told when I and my friend Mr. Talboys mean to leave Essex. To this letter is enjoined a postscript, reiterating the above request. 7. We call at the court and ask to see the house. My lady's apartments are locked. 8. We get at the aforementioned apartments by means of a secret passage, the existence of which is unknown to my lady. In one of the rooms we find her portrait. 9. George is frightened at the storm. His conduct is exceedingly strange for the rest of the evening. 10. George quite himself again the following morning. I propose leaving Audley Court immediately. He prefers remaining till the evening. 11. We go out fishing. George leaves me to go to the court. 12. The last positive information I can obtain of him in Essex is at the court, where the servant says he thinks Mr. Talboys told him he would go and look for my lady in the grounds. 18. I receive information about him at the station, which may or may not be correct. 14. I hear of him positively once more at Southampton, where, according to his father-in-law, he has been for an hour on the previous night. 15. The Telegraphic Message When Robert Audley had completed this brief record, which he drew up with great deliberation and with frequent pauses for reflection, alterations, and erasures, he sat for a long time contemplating the written page. At last, he read it carefully over, stopping at some of the numbered paragraphs and marking several of them with a penciled cross. Then he folded the sheet of foolscap 
went over to a cabinet on the opposite side of the room, unlocked it, and placed the paper in that very pigeonhole in which he had thrust Alicia's letter. The pigeonhole marked important. Having done this, he returned to his easy chair by the fire, pushed away his desk, and lighted a cigar. It's as dark as midnight from first to last, he said, and the clue to the mystery must be found either at Southampton or in Essex. Be it how it may, my mind is made up. I shall first go to Audley Court and look for George Talboys in a narrow radius. To be continued in our next. Here is where chapter 13 ends. <laughs>